Again, a question of what did that surveillance footage capture? Gene, I want to just talk more about that motive that you mentioned, you know, the financial motive here, these checks that were written off of the QuickBooks account, because the defense is saying, hey, there was a financial motive here, but it wasn't a financial motive of our client. It was of Dan Kavanaugh, this other suspect. So they're going forward with another financial motive theory, but from a different business associate. I'm curious your thoughts on that. Well, it depends on how much is owed by Kavanaugh to uh, Joseph McStay. If it's an unremarkable amount, um, that dog probably won't hunt uh, for the defense. But if it is a remarkable amount and a significant amount for Mr. Kavanaugh, then maybe uh, maybe the old theory that someone else did it um, uh, could fly. I would add that one of the issues that uh, always um, impressed me is mm -hmm. That video of what appeared to be a couple with two children walking across the Mexican USA border. Mm -hmm. if, if the jury believes that that is the McStay family and the Azuzu trooper is found near the border, that is pretty darn good, reasonable doubt. Hey, listen, authorities ruled it out. They said it wasn't the McStays, this wasn't a, a consequence of the drug cartels, but. It is interesting why their car was parked near there and that family that seems to resemble the McStays. But speaking of surveillance footage, let's continue on with Jennifer Mitchley when she was under cross-examination. Take a look. Now, you said at some point the camera system you set up uh, was originally installed as uh, always recording and you switched it to motion detection. Yes. Was there something that you wanted to see that you couldn't see as recorded over because it was always recording? Is that what made you change? No, it was just me thinking ahead and not wanting. I wanted it to last a while and not use up the hard drive. So I adjusted it. On the always record setting, how much time could your hard drive save before you switched it? The 24 7 would do about two months. So it can save two months worth if you record it all the time? Yes. Did you have a function in there where if something wasn't important, you can save it so it's excluded from the auto uh, override? All right, so Gene, I just before we go to our next break, I want to just talk a little bit more about the Mexico situation. So when you read about the case, it was first thought the drug cartels might have been responsible for this. The idea of a sledgehammer brutal murder doesn't seem to be something so outside the realm of something that they would do. But that was ruled out, and it was ruled out by authorities that, that the McStays were that family. But, not, but the prosecution still has to put that evidence in, right? Yes, they have to eliminate the possible alternative theory. But let me tell you this. Just because authorities have ruled out and in their mind that the, the parents and the two children in that video are not the McStays, that doesn't mean the jury's not going to believe it possibly could be the McStays. And I was taught this from an early age trying cases. What are the facts of a case? Whatever a jury believes. So who cares what law enforcement believes? It's what a jury believes. And you're talking about, of course, reasonable doubt here. That's what the defense is trying to put in. And we are going to see a continuation of this back and forth between the prosecution and the defense as soon as we are back live in that courtroom. Could be any minute now. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk more about the McStay family murder case. Welcome back, everybody. So we expect to be live in California in the Charles Merritt case any minute. As soon as we have a feed, we're going to make sure to go there. Our very own uh, Kathy Russin, executive trial producer here on Law and Crime, has been there day in and day out reporting back to us about what has been happening in that courtroom. We expect a really exciting day with some key witnesses, some really good cross-examination. But right now, we're recapping what you may have missed, so you're ready moving up to the live feed today. Now, we saw last week the testimony of Michael McStay, who's Joseph McStay's brother. He took the stand and talked about how he and the defendant made an attempt to go into the McStay family home after they disappeared. But things took a little interesting turn. Take a look. Well, at some point, did you get some information from a neighbor? Yes, sir. 
Okay. Whether it was on the 13th or the 15th or whatever, was is it significant to you in your efforts to find your brother? Um, yes, sir. And what was that information? Um, the, the neighbor had said, I can't remember which, I might have been the one to the left, um, in the cold, is that, that they had saw a work truck or something that had been parked there? Did they give you a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, they kind of described it like a work truck. Okay. Did they give you a time frame of when they saw this truck? They couldn't remember. Okay. Did, I mean, but could they even tell you uh, uh, that they'd even talked to your brother or met your brother or the family? Um, a, a few of them had commented that they'd met the family when they moved in there to Sweden and all that, but that's about it. Okay. Did that information the neighbor give you cause you any type to do anything in particular in looking for your brother? Um, at that point, I was starting to get concerned, but because um, the next day was Valentine's, that Sunday would be the 14th, but I had talked with, and I had talked with friends and, you know, my dad and everyone else, my, my mom, um, I just said, drop dead date, 9 a.m. on Monday morning, I'm going to the police office to, regardless. Let me uh, fill in our calendar real quick before we move on. So the 13th, you were at the house. Yes. Were you aware of, from the 1st through now the 15th, were you aware of any other person's act, uh, efforts to have a welfare check done at the house looking for your brother during that time period? I had heard that Mr. Cavanaugh had made one, but I'm not sure. Okay. Did that go into your state of mind, though, about how you were processing all this information? Yes, sir. Okay. When was the last time you were down that way? Um, one or two years after their disappearance, I went and did a job in Tijuana for a skateboard company. But that's the last time I've been there. How about before? Okay, Gene, so his testimony really heats up when he starts talking about the fact that he visited the McStay family home with the defendant, but the defendant didn't want to go in, according to him, because he had a criminal record. What did you make of this exchange? How important is this in the overall theme of the case? I don't think it's uh, drastically important. It is a little odd that uh, he mentioned his criminal record, but I don't think it's earth-shattering uh, on the scale of whether he's guilty or innocent. You know, people are trying to get answers to what happened. They're trying to see what my, uh, Mr. Merritt's involvement was here. Is there a value to putting the defendant on the stand, or do they not need to do this in this kind of case? I would not put the defendant on the stand in this case because I think there's uh, depends on how the rest of the trial goes, though. But at this point, I would not put him on the stand because there are, based on the defense attorney's excellent opening, there are elements of reasonable doubt that they can latch onto. And if you have two or three, you know, latches that you could put your case on for reasonable doubt, I wouldn't put the defendant on the stand unless the case gets progressively stronger for the prosecution. Now, I'll tell you, this case is, uh, <laughs> there's arguments both ways. It's a very interesting trial to follow. Oh, I'm so glad you said that because you look at a fact or you look at a statement and you can argue it two different ways. You could say, oh, this seems suspicious or this seems benign. The same thing, and I'm glad you mentioned it, with the money that he took out after the, the mixed days went missing or when he tried to get, uh, when, when he had uh, Joseph's mother send him money to continue on with the, the fountain business. You could look at it and say, oh, this guy is clearly embezzling the McStays. He had a motive yep. to get rid of them. The other way of looking at it is, hey, listen, he just wanted to keep the business running. He was owed money. And, and the other thing, Jesse, is I would embrace, it, you know, the evidence is coming out that there's these weird transactions on the QuickBooks. I would embrace it as a defense attorney and say this. Okay, there was a $4,000 check, there was a $3,000 check. Members of the jury, are you gonna believe that my client, Chase Merritt, murdered four people over $8,000? That's beyond belief. The, the, the counter argument to that is, I've seen people 
murder for a lot less. And I mean, that's sure. the other way to look at it. And, and yeah. we'll, talk, we'll talk more about that, Gene. Let's just play a little bit more of Michael McStay because he was a key witness from last week. Take a look. Well, in the, in the three and a half years they were missing, you held out hope that they were somewhere, right? Yes, sir. I set up a website. I, I um, did whatever I could. Okay. And sometimes that holding out hope was speculating that they were in Big Bear or gone to Hawaii or other places, right? Yes, sir. Did you ever get any evidence or be made aware of any evidence that they, in fact, were in Big Bear, Hawaii, Mexico, anywhere? No, sir. Were you shown a video of a family crossing the border by Detective DeGaulle at some point? I was. Did you think that was them? Absolutely not. I even said so to the detectives. I laughed and I said, is this the best you have? I take you were a little disappointed. Yeah. Um, yeah. As part of your efforts to help locate your brother's family, did you seek the help and assistance from people and organizations, uh, well, out in California and outside California? You try to hold out hope. That's all you can do. What was your reaction when you learned that? Uh, some remains have been found out by Victorville that were possibly your family. Sorry, weeping. What did you do when you learned that? I um I called my mother. I made sure she wasn't around people at work. She said she was at work. I um, made sure that she was, you know, in a safe place before I told her. I think I actually had to call her back because of that. Um, and I basically just repeated what the detectives told me. Just a compelling witness overall. Again, the brother of Joseph McStay. Back here with Gene Rossi. Gene, uh, we expect today that San Diego County Detective Tony Dugal, who was the lead detective when the family went missing, will take the stand today. I'm curious, what do you think, if you're the defense, what are you going to cross-examine him about? I, oh, boy, that could lead to a treasure trove of things that could help the defense. You know, how how diligently did you look at alternative theories such as another person did it? How how uh, diligent were you in investigating whether that car at the border, the trooper at the border, was placed there by a drug lord or drug gangs? You know, what efforts did you take to try to exonerate our client, Mr. Merritt, or were you predisposed and preconditioned to point the finger at him. It's a two-edged sword. I've seen agents get on the stand and on cross by the defense. They basically destroyed my case because a judge, depending on the judge, allowed them to get into how diligent were they in looking at other theories. And if the jury concludes they're sloppy and they should have dug deeper at these leads, then they're probably going to hold it against the government. But, but you've seen cases before where juries actually believe, hey, listen, th is there a fear that, hey, if, they, if this guy's been arrested, if this guy's on trial, they must have the right guy. I mean, it can't possibly be a, a, a Dan Kavanaugh character. It can't be this other person. They looked him up. He's, he, otherwise, he'd be on trial, too. Is that ever a fear? Yes. Oh, that, that because the government indicted Gene Rossi, he must be the person? Oh, oh. Or as opposed to this other guy, Dan Kavanaugh. Yeah. Yep, yep. But I, ha I, I can remember an acquittal. <laughs> Prosecutors don't like to talk about acquittals. I remember acquittal. It was Tony Barr and the jury, I firmly believe, I didn't talk to him. They felt that we literally got the wrong guy. It was a marijuana conspiracy. And they, they felt that, they, that we had gotten the wrong guy. Of course, I didn't think so, but they did. And um, so, and it was partly because when I put on law enforcement, 
they sort of poo-pooed these other people that could have been involved in the conspiracy. That's why I have sort of PTSD flashbacks <laughs> about putting on a, a law enforcement and having a cross of their efforts, how diligent they, right. they were, because I lost the case because of that. No, I understand. And I, I guess the question is, if you're the defense, you're going to really have to stress this theory. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. Gene, I'm signing off, but guess what? Bob Bianchi's no. coming in. So don't worry. You're in great hands. He's going to guide everyone through the next chapter of the McStay family murder case, the Charles Merritt trial, and we expect to be live any moment, stay tuned here on Law and Crime. Network. My name is Bob Bianchi, and I'm going to be taking it from 12:30 to 4 today. We have this fascinating McStay family murder case. I can't wait to talk to Gene Rossi, who's going to still be on with us after Jesse, uh, to talk about this case. I think there's a lot to it, uh, but we also know the judge is in court right now, and they're having a little bit of a discussion about the fact that the defendant Merritt's criminal record came out on the stand. When we get to anything significant in that court, we will go right to it. But as you guys know this Jamie Klaus uh, case is unbelievable young girl rescued thought gone her parents killed there she is and we had exclusively last week on the law and crime network our own Heather Hansen who was able to speak to the individuals that helped save this girl in particular there were two people that came to her rescue and ultimately expatiation away from this horrible guy the arraignment will be at 4 30 but let's take a look a, look, a little look at those interviews when I saw her, I knew she was in trouble because I knew she had, wherever she came from, she left in a hurry. I didn't know if somebody had just dropped her off or because she just had on um, a sweatshirt and leggings and shoes that were too big for her. All I knew is when she told me who she was, I, I obviously know the circumstances of her disappearance and what happened to her parents. and. I knew the person who had her was not a good person, and I needed to be, have her in a safe place. I went to the first house I thought of because I kind of know the guy there, but he wasn't home. So then I said, okay, Kristen lives down the road for me. I know she's a teacher. I know she'll help us. Uh, my first thoughts were I, I basically went into shock. Yeah, I mean, it was like I was literally seeing a ghost. We've seen pictures and TV ads and all this stuff. And to have her come in the house and say, this is Jamie Kloss, call 911, was unreal. You know, I, I didn't think she was alive. And then to see that in my kitchen was, it was quite the shocker. Um, she said she did not know him before this happened. We didn't ask any questions other than who was it and what are they driving, because we were on, on the phone with 911 at the time. So we were able to give them the name and uh, the color of the car that he was driving anyway. We asked her if she was okay, if she... We asked her if she wanted, like, something to eat, something to drink, and she said, no, I'm fine. And she looked really cold, so I just got a blanket out of, off of the couch, and I said, you look cold. If you're not, you can take it off, but put this blanket on because you look like you're freezing. She was here for approximately a half an hour altogether when the police, it was probably about 15 to 20 minutes before the police arrived at the house, and then they were here for maybe five minutes or so once they identified her. They had another... Uh, car come in and get her out of here and get her to safety. I told Jamie when she was sitting on my couch yesterday, I just said, I am so glad to see you. Well, wow, what an unbelievably positive note and, and a major, massive, horrible tragedy. I got my Gene Rossi with me. For those of you who turned in, my hashtag 4041 friend, uh, three decades at the DOJ, trained over a 1,000 prosecutors, prolific trial career, now criminal defense attorney, legal analyst on the Law and Crime Network, and has his own radio show, The Gene Rossi Show. Gene, it's good to be back with you, my friend. Oh, it's good to be back. I missed you for half an hour. I know. I, I kind of felt jealous that you, you had Jesse for that time. But uh, that's okay. We'll make up for it in the next—I'll uh, be here at least to four. So listen, 
Uh, Gene, I mean, this is really amazing, right? We all know from missing persons cases, I've handled many of them, that as time goes on, uh, it's not good. And we should let our audience know that both of these parents were murdered. And apparently, from the investigation so far, she was just a specifically targeted person. There was no real connection between them. He abducted her. And to keep somebody abducted for 88 days, I believe it was, or, or somewhere in that time vicinity, takes a lot of effort and planning, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. It's premeditation on steroids because you got to find a place to live. You have to, or keep her, you know, in kidnap. Uh, you have to, it, it does take a lot of premeditation. Absolutely. You know, and, and you can't, you know, you go into these cases, Gina, and I always say, and I guess this may be why you get paranoid when you've done this for so long, so many years for me as a prosecutor and now as a defense lawyer, that it's just the randomness of it. And, and it just seems to me in the three decades that I've been practicing law that, when we were dealing with abduction cases or murder cases when I first started as a baby prosecutor, there was a motive, there was a connection. It just seems to me to be more and more random and disturbing today where you have just targeted people for no reason and one day you're living your life and you never know what can happen to a loved one or even yourself. Yeah, this is a good example of how allegedly Jake uh, Patterson, I think there was a lot of anger in him, a lot of depression, a lot of uh, bitterness, and it just was building like a volcano. And and Jamie Kloss and her parents were became the targets serendipitously. I mean, he didn't yeah. he didn't focus on them initially. Right, and just, you know the the idea that uh, this young girl had the courage to be able to escape under those psychological circumstances is really quite amazing. I'm being told in the McStay family murder case that we have a family friend that's taking a stand. Let's go back to court. Okay, so Gene Rossi, let's get a little talk here because um, prosecutors laying out a timeline. I love timelines. I love timelines as far as an investigation is concerned, and I love them when you present them to the jury. They really do frame very well the cadence of the case. And this timeline is all the times that this family friend who introduced both of these, pa these people together, the, uh, Joseph Summer, um, he was there painting on the 31st, the 1st, the 2nd, and the 3rd, and on two of those occasions, Chase, the defendant, was there. I think I know why the prosecutor's doing it. What are your thoughts? Here's the punchline. Everybody on that jury has probably renovated their home. And the last thing you do is, when you're doing renovation, is to go to Mexico on a trip. Yep. There's absolutely no way. This is a powerful yet subtle witness because it is destroying a theory of the defense that, oh, we got in the Isuzu, we drove to the Mexico border, parked the car, and walked across the border. You know, That's Gene, what happened. Gene, I, I, I've been really following this case, and our own Kathy Russin is on top of it and sending us all sorts of notes real time from the courtroom proceedings, from the scene. What I'm finding difficult to understand from an investigative point of view as a person that literally was on these scenes doing these things is this family up and disappears. Ultimately, they find that there's food on the table and the dogs hadn't been fed. To your point, they're doing construction. Summer's agitated a couple of times because it's not moving in the progress that she wants. They up and disappear, to your point. Uh, they're gone. Like, why is this not a foul play investigation as opposed to a missing persons investigation right from the get-go? That, that's <laughs> when an investigator takes the stand, you can guarantee that cross-examination will focus on, you had all these red flags and loud gongs that suggest it was an abduction, but, but why didn't you begin a murder investigation ab initio? And that'll probably uh, be an Achilles heel during the prosecution's witnesses. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Gene, this case is really fascinating to me because I hope we have some time a little bit later on for me to go through a couple of defense theories in the case that I'd be arguing on behalf of the defendant because to me it's a razor edge case. And I think that a lot of what happened here up to and including the, the police investigation or lack thereof and waiting a year after the, the, the bones were recovered is all gonna come back to haunt them a little bit. We'll talk about that a little bit more though, uh, because listen, it's to me right now a 50-50 that each side a great lawyering happening on each side, which we both love. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be back on the other end.
Okay. Hey, Gene Rossi, uh, so yeah. far, you know, what we got from the last time we talked is this timeline. He's actually a very interesting witness. He's an individual that brought this couple together. He's working on their home, to your point. They're clearly expecting him to come back on the 6th. They, he doesn't hear from them any longer. Then the mother, Susan, who testified in this trial, asked him, uh, Mr. McCarger, will you come with me to the house? And he just found it so peculiar that the dog was left uh, without food, without shelter, that the Susan was very, uh, rather, uh, Summer was very close to this dog. There were eggs on the counter. And I found this interesting. Even he had the intuitiveness to say when mom started cleaning up the kitchen, this was after the investigators had been there and she was cleaning up. He was saying to himself, wow, I think she may be like cleaning up some evidence because he was suspicious, obviously more suspicious than the crime scene investigators or lack thereof of the police department. That doesn't bode well for the government's witnesses when they take the stand. And I got to tell you, this is a fit. I love, first off, I love his name, MacGyver McCarger. And he, he is just a salt of the earth, a painter, a helper, a marriage counselor, a good friend. And he describes all these little red flags to suggest something is a muck. You know, the clothes in the closet, the paint can. Um, he, he uh, the, the cover removed. He had this sixth sense that is absolutely remarkable. Yeah, and he actually said that he was making mental notes from what it was when he left to when he got there. So clearly this guy thought some foul play had occurred. And of course, if the murder occurred there, which I understand is the prosecution's theory of the case, and you have blunt force trauma where skulls are literally being smashed by a sledgehammer, the amount of DNA is extraordinary, very, very hard to clean up, no matter how hard you try. But we got cross-examination of this witness. Let's go back to court. Okay, so Gene Rossi, let's go to some of the cross-examination of this witness by the defense. One of the first things he did, in my opinion, was get right to the heart of two major things. She's cleaning up the food, talking about the mother Susan, which we talked about before, and the paint can had dry paint in it. My opinion is the reason he's bringing that out is sloppy investigation and the real killer's DNA was cleaned up. Absolutely, cleaning the... If they were killed inside that home, there would be fingerprints on the counter, on the doors, on the floor. It would be all over the house. Yeah. And that she wiped a potential uh, DNA scene is very helpful to the defense. Now, I want to add the paint can is extremely odd because it's inconsistent with Summer's uh, desire to keep things clean. So that's an odd thing that's in favor of the government. Gene, well, I'm in the chat room today, and I, I love our chatters and the commentaries that they're making. Um, and, and I do agree with, uh, and I'm just giving my opinion, having handled homicide cases of blunt force trauma of, not, of just one victim, not to mention that we got four here, is that blood is everywhere. Cast off is everywhere. You could clean as much as you want. It's in the fibers of rugs. I've literally had homicide cases where we lifted the linoleum tile off floors and found blood seeping you know, underneath there. I'm really going to be interested in terms of the crime scene investigation to see whether, even though the scene was compromised, they went back in and ripped all that stuff up and still couldn't find anything because just on my experience, I'm not saying that it can't be, but in my experience, it is extraordinary to me. You're not going to find at least blood trace hairs, all sorts of things of this nature at that scene, if that's where the murder took place. It, it, well, here's what I'm thinking may have happened, and I don't know if the government has the evidence to prove this. We had a case in federal court in Alexander, Virginia, where the defendant lured the victim out of the home. So I'm wondering if there's even a, a little bit of evidence to suggest that the whole family, by ruse, by trickery, by deception, was actually lured out of that home so that the actual murder occurred uh, some other location. And is it possible that they were put under by some type of um, anesthetic or anything like that? I don't know. Because you hit the nail on the head, there would be blood everywhere. At least one dot of blood would be somewhere. 
Now, Gene, we only have a minute left, but I want to get into this cross-examination piece about Dan. The Dan they're referring to is Dan Cavanaugh. That's the third party, the other business partner that the defense is saying he's the one that did it. They jumped to the conclusions and said it was Chaz, Mr. Merritt, but they got it wrong. The judge excluded them pointing the finger, uh, what we call third party guilt, which is generally, if there's any evidence in the case that suggests it's possible, allowed. Again, I think we get back to a spot where the prosecutors may find themselves in an appeal appealable issue. And as you can see, they're trying to get it out on cross with this witness and the judge's limiting it. But Bob, you hit the nail on the head. We've been saying this since I've come on the show. Pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Under federal rule of evidence 804, a person who makes a statement against interest and you can connect them to the crime, that statement comes in even if they're not available to testify. And of course, Dan Kavanaugh would be unavailable. He has a Fifth Amendment right. So I'm wondering if the prosecutors are too cute by half because they are prohibiting what could be the gestalt, the crux of the defense is that another dude did it. Right, I, and I agree with you, Gene, and hopefully we're going to be able to get into some instant messages that were actually preserved between Joseph and Mr. Kavanaugh that were really relevant, in my opinion. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'm here with Gene Rossi. We're doing the McStay family murder case. Gene, I want to follow up with this point with our audience because I think it's a really, really important one. And it's a look for our, our true crime lovers. Evidence, evidence, evidence. It's all about what you can introduce. So the defense tried to bring in this what we call third party guilt of this guy, Kavanaugh. The judge refused to allow them to do that. Why is this important? Because they argued that there was information that Mr. Kavanaugh threatened to destroy McStay's business if Kavanaugh's demands were not met. And the later, this is a quote, you respond and deal with this, the worse it's going to be. That led to Mr. McStay, who eventually was murdered, to, to quote, respond back, now I, Summer, and kids know the real you and what you would be potentially due to harm me and my family. You're a great guy, Dan, expletive sad. And then the defense tried to get in this statement that was made in 2013 in relation to a completely separate business transaction with a completely separate, unassociated person to this case. And that was where Mr. Kavanaugh is alleged to have said, you know, that he knew how to make people disappear. And if anything happens again, they will find that person's bones in the desert. The prosecution argues that there was motive because there was a business dispute between Mr. Kavanaugh and Mr. McStay, and that they should be able to introduce that to the jury for the life of me, and I'm going to find out about this. I don't understand how that evidence is excluded. Bob, I got to give you another theory. The first statement you made when Joe, Joey or Joe sent that text uh, to Kavanaugh, you could get that in under adoptive admission. Because that's a statement to which Dan should have responded, you're crazy, I would never do harm to anyone. So that's one theory. But the other theory, and I hope we find out about this, is 804, statement against interest. This is classic 804, and the judge probably found that it was too speculative, you couldn't corroborate it and connect it to the crime. I don't see how you can't connect it to the crime. Well, it's showing a business partner. I mean, if the prosecution's motive in this case is, is that Merritt had a financial motive and reason yeah. to do it. Now, I have to say for purposes of this, the prosecution's counter argument was that Mr. Kavanaugh was in Hawaii, um, you know, when this happened. And uh, they, made, they made some other argument here uh, that he actually called the police to do a welfare check. But that does not mean, doesn't mean that Mr. Kavanaugh did it. And I'm not suggesting that he did. But it doesn't mean that somebody didn't do it on his behalf. But when you have those statements that are being made, and interesting to me, Gene, when he's saying that Summer knows and the kids know, and even though they're really young, maybe this is a reason somebody could have because they, the whole family, knows something. 
to maybe do harm to the entire family. I'm just saying, I'm not saying Mr. Kavanaugh did it. I was just surprised the court suppressed it. And I am very confident at the end of the day that this is going to be a major issue on appeal. And my question becomes, Gene Rossi, if so, if there's a conviction and it's appealed on that basis, will we be back again at the Law and Crime Network again with yet another retrial for a prosecutor, as you put it, hogs get slaughtered? Yes, and here's why. This is a death penalty case. And if he gets the death penalty from this jury, if he's found guilty, I can guarantee you that appellate court is going to reverse. Now, if he gets life, maybe not. Mm -hmm. But when you have such high stakes, I got to read the briefs yeah. of these prosecutors to find out, you know, are you sure you made the right decision here? Right, and Gene, we talk about this all the time. Even if the legal ruling was technically correct, and we don't know, we don't have all the briefs, we didn't see the arguments, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And the point you bring out is excellent. When you're dealing with a penalty conviction, a death penalty conviction, the judges are even more strict on appeal to make sure everything was done correctly. So when I tried death penalty cases, essentially I let the defense do whatever they wanted so there would not be an argument they were stopped from pursuing a viable defense. Bob, I gotta tell you, and I, I hate to criticize prosecutors because I was one, but I don't. I hardly objected during the cross and even a direct by a defense counsel because unless it's really, really bad, um, I'm not going to object. He did have one good objection because it violated arguably the motion in limine. Right. But I don't object on, on leading or I just right. don't do that. Gene, we had a witness that testified previously, Michael Tingley. He was a sergeant. It's an interesting person because this sergeant actually went with the brother into the home when it was kind of a quasi missing persons case. Pay particularly a note, audience, and those are in the chat room. We love having you chat in there. That it was turned over to the homicide squad. Let's take a look. After talking to Mike, after finding the vehicle, what did you do next? Well, then uh, after I received all that pertinent information, I wanted to go with uh, Mr. McStay to the residence. He wanted to go check it out, so I told him I would go with him. We could check it out together. Okay. What happened? Well, then we, I followed him, or I drove down, and he followed me, um, or I followed him. I can't remember if he was in front or back. But either way, we both went down to the residence to check the, uh, the house. What happened when you got to the house? Well, once we got to the house, uh, I had McStay, you know, stated that he could check the residence and, and the back window was open. So he elected to go ahead and crawl through the window and open the front door for me. Well, why did you have him do that? Well, still at this point, um, I wasn't, I knew that he was reporting a missing, but just because someone reported missing, it doesn't give you a right to technically go into their house and start searching the house unless there's some, you know, something that gives you that right. So in this scenario, just to keep things on, you know, the the side of no warrant or no information, like information that's created in exigent circumstances, um, I wanted to make sure that legally um, we were covered as far as going to the house and because he's a brother and he has permission to go in the house and stated that he's had permission to go in the house and has crawled into the window through the house, I elected to have him do it. He indicated you he had been in there before, right? Yes, sir, he has. Uh, did he indicate when that was specifically? Uh, it wasn't a concrete uh, date. Again, it wasn't a concrete date, but it was before? Correct. Okay. Um, the So you had him go in and let you in? That's correct. And how did... How did that happen? Well, then he went in the backyard, crawled to the window, and then I met him at the front door. What, did what you go in the backyard? Do? Well, then we do what's called a um, a welfare check. I wanted to go in the house just to make sure that there wasn't uh, any sign of, you know, any, you know, any blood or anything that just stuck out to be abnormal since we are taking a missing person of four, which is not normal. Um, we don't do that very often, should I say. And so I wanted to go in and check and make sure there wasn't anything that we were missing as far as um, foul play or anything like that. Make sure that if there were people in there, that we could have, you know, helped them if they needed help.
Okay. So what did you do? We did a walkthrough of the residence, checking each uh, room inside the residence. You said, I'm sorry, uh, you said we, did M Mr. McStay go with you? He was with me, yes. Okay. Um, was it dark yet, or was it still somewhat light out, or? I believe it was still somewhat light. Okay, did you have to turn on lights in the house, or use a flashlight? No, I believe it was light. It, light. Was, still, it was still bright enough for us to not have to do that. Okay. And as part of that welfare check um, and cursory search, it wasn't a real in-depth search, was it? No, we weren't uh, going through drawers or anything like that. We were just basically looking in each room and, and checking the closet and the bathrooms and things like that to make sure that there wasn't any. Okay, so Sergeant Tingley is now at the house with Joseph's brother. Uh, they go inside and they want to see, they do a welfare check, as he calls it, and uh, to see if there's any abnormal signs or anything missing. Let's listen to a little more. It's the only thing that I believe to be obvious signs of struggle. Well, a knocked over lamp could be, right? Could be. Actually. But it didn't stick out to you, you're saying? No, sir. Okay. Uh, did you see any obvious signs of blood, tissue, dead bodies, anything like that? No, sir. What else would you look for? Uh, blood on the walls, door jams, uh, broken glass, uh, maybe broken windows, um, you know, things that... Uh, That would normally be what you might believe to be out of place, maybe something near the front door, like as they're getting dragged out, something just to that effect. Was this normal? Can you uh, Sorry. go further into the question, please? You didn't see any of those things? No, sir. But you called homicide? Yes, sir. So if this was not normal, why'd you call homicide? Well... For several reasons. One, uh, when we did go in, it, it appeared that uh, there was plates of food that were half eaten and just left, and they weren't picked up or moved. Um, people who have families, um, normally after they're done eating, will at least take their dishes to the sink or counter, or somebody will pick them up. Um, it's a missing family of four, um, which is not something that's reported on a daily basis which uh, strikes to have a little concern as far as, you know, maybe something is going on. Uh, the information that I had received from Mr. Lipstay was that something was not right, you know, something was going on. There was just something not jiving. So when we did the walk through the house, you know, I noticed that they weren't fully unpacked. It didn't appear that it was a fully furnished home. Um, it appeared that whoever was there, in my mind, had just got up and left, which didn't seem, just raised suspicion. It didn't seem like that would be something normal. So to cover my bases as far as making sure that we crossed our T's and dotted our I's, I contacted our homicide sergeant because anything that goes further than 10 days, uh, they receive or follow up and further investigation. So I wanted to let them know what we had to see if they wanted me to do anything else with the incident or if they wanted to respond out and assess the situation. Gene Rossi, as you know, a defense attorney is going to always argue about the things the cops didn't do that they should have done or mistakes that were made or evidence that was not secured or gotten because it's about creating reasonable doubt, potentially third parties that could have done it. So here's what we know. Sergeant Tingley goes in there with the brother for a welfare check. He at first testifies in the first clip. He sees nothing abnormal or anything missing. How, he looks for uh, the jams of the doors, glass, windows, see things broken, uh, places broken into. But then the prosecutor has to get around this one. And the prosecutor gets out in front of it and says, but why'd you call homicide? Okay, so we remember the friend that goes in there earlier that we listened to his testimony. He felt something was awry and something wasn't right. And in the answer to that question, why this sergeant called homicide, he said food was half eaten, family dishes usually are brought to the sink. You have four people that are missing, including two that are children. Something just didn't seem right. Um, he was, it was just not 
something that people just get up and leave like that. And he wanted to dot I's and cross T's, and that's why he called homicide. Yes, that's exactly what should have been done maybe a lot earlier, but that's exactly the protocol because it's clear this cop knew something's not right. Right. In those few days, whether it's five days, seven days, was the crime scene compromised to an extent that evidence that exculpates the defendant was tainted or eliminated. And when you the say exculpates, what you mean to say by that is that evidence that could have been there or evidence of maybe a third party that could have shown exculpation means that it wasn't Mr. Merritt was not captured and or was destroyed. Right. Exculpate to me means pointing towards innocence. And there could have been prints that pointed to our in innocence because they could have been Kavanaugh's or somebody else. There could have been blood that pointed towards innocence that may have been compromised. The sky's the limit. Right. And we will know before I go to break that when the forensic people did the examination of the graves and the skulls and the, the panties and bra of summer, there was some DNA recovered that did not come back to Mr. Merritt, did not come back to Mr. Kavanaugh and has yet to be identified. This case is something else. Let's go to break. Okay, well, there's a little bit of a slowdown in the courtroom there. Gene Rossi, so far, um, I mean, this guy's holding up. Uh, defense is scoring its points through him. Uh, but I'm really interested as to where they're going to go with this conversation, these conversations that are going on. What are your thoughts? It's very simple. Anytime a witness takes a stand, bias, prejudice, sympathy, and empathy and veracity are fair game. Davis versus Alaska Supreme Court case. And what the cross-examination is doing is, is going after whether the de detective or detectives coached him down a particular path to help prove their theory against the defendant. I think this is proper cross-examination. Yeah, we talk about this all the time, Gene Rossi. I have witnessed it firsthand over and over and over again. Confirmation bias. Once they have a guy, they tend to stick with it, and sometimes they can go in a wobbly and bad direction, and that is exactly what the defense attorney is doing. Gene, I should also bring out that if our audience is not in the chat room, you've got to get in there. Gene, you need to get in there because people actually find me and you both entertaining and informative. <laughs> hey, you know what? We also talk about polenta. We don't just stick to the law. No, we are. Yeah. I just used a meatball analogy the other day. Hey, let's go back to court. <laughs> I want to go back to Joseph and Summer. You introduced Joseph and Summer, correct? Correct. And when you introduced them, you were actually interested in Summer's friend. You said, Joey, you take Summer, I'll take her friend. No objection, relevance. <laughs> During your conversations with Summer and Joseph, they both treated you like the middleman, as you said, correct? Correct. And so any disagreements between them, they both kind of came to you. Correct. And during those conversations, they both expressed that maybe they should... Objection calls for hearsay. But it goes to their state of mind. And counsel open the door. Counsel approach. Okay, it's always hurry up and start in the courtrooms, Gene, right? So there are a lot of objections being made by the prosecution here, um, and the judge is affirming some of them. And I was going to say to you before, I was surprised the defense isn't going and making a record of the objections so that they're preserved for appeal. But as soon as I thought it, it happened. Well, what we need to educate our viewers, because they seem to like us, um, you're talking about making an offer of proof if a judge denies your attempt to bring in evidence, if the judge prohibits you from bringing in evidence, either in a filing or verbally, you make an offer of proof mm -hmm. so that the appellate record can see why you wanted to bring it in. What I don't understand is this, Bob, the open the door response that the defense attorney had is right on the mark 
the prosecutor was talking about all these conversations that Summer and Joe had, and now the defense attorney is trying to get into that, and they're objecting and won't let him. I, I don't get it. Right. I don't get it. Gene, I want to go to your point because a lot of law students, a lot of attorneys follow this show, and having uh, great guys like you on there with our experience, I cannot underestimate or overestimate, if you will, the importance of making the record like Gene Rossi said, because if you go to argue about it later on and the appellate division doesn't understand the basis of it, then you don't have the ability to be able to make a successful argument. They're back in court. Let's listen. All right, Gene, so observation so far, this cross-examination. Overall, what's occurred? Where do you think they're going to go? Well, it goes through your point, Bob, that uh, confirmation bias is always a powerful cross-examine area. And I think that was the highlight reel for uh, the defense attorney is when he was trying his best to get to the confirmation bias. The other questions, um, I, I, I don't know where they are going, frankly. Um, I'm not sure where he's going with the screwdriver, but uh, I, I would like your 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 opinion because I'm confused. We'll we'll get that on the other end because they're back uh, with testimony. So let's listen to it. All right, guys, we have developments in the Jamie Kloss case. That's where Jake Peterson has been arrested. I have in front of me right now documentation officially filed by the state of Wisconsin against Jake P uh, Peterson, Patterson, rather. Um, I have it right here, just reading it, so I'm going to go through it with you real quick. We have two counts of first-degree intentional homicide for the October 15th. 2018 killing of Jamie's parents, each which carries a sentence of up to life imprisonment if convicted, and a third charge of kidnapping, that would be for Jamie herself, as well as armed burglary. I'm looking at the probable cause affidavit here, folks. This is one heck of a case. We've been asking lots of questions here at the Law and Crime Network and on other stations about what precipitated this. From my reading of this arrest affidavit, it had nothing more to do than he decided he was going to kidnap and abduct somebody and he saw her getting on a school bus there was absolutely no connection he had planned and plotted this in great detail there you see a picture of the young lady right there he was going to forcibly enter with a shotgun he used a shotgun because he confessed to the police that he knew could create the greatest carnage he wiped that shotgun down wiped, wa washed the shell casings had gloves on had a mask because he didn't want his DNA anywhere to be found, including taking a shower just before going to the home that he had cased for a number of days. He was getting to the door, but the family became alerted, and the father was inside with a flashlight shining outside. And an altercation, if you will, kind of occurs outside where he demands that the father open the door. Apparently, the father thought that he may have been a police officer and asks him to show his identification. Eventually, the defendant shoots through the door, kills the father. Now, if you can imagine this scene, as I understand it from this probable cause affidavit, now mom and the girl go into a bathroom and they barricade the bathroom door and they're now hiding in a bathtub with a shower curtain over it and this uh, character, this animal, goes inside there with duct tape and then tells the mother of all things to start duct taping her daughter. Eventually mom isn't able to comply with all this. He puts a shotgun down on the sink. This is very detailed in the affidavit. He finalizes duct taping her arms and her mouth and her legs and then shoots the mother point blank blank right in the head. Why? Because he knew a headshot with a shotgun would accomplish the result of killing her and he didn't want any witnesses. A harrowing description is then given as he's trying to get the young girl out of the house and tries to get her to get up to walk, but she's duct taped on her legs so she can't. So he's literally dragging her through pools of blood as he brings her outside, eventually takes her, puts her in a trunk after having disarmed the light in the trunk and the light in the car and having fictitious plates so he couldn't get identified but they had gotten a 911 call off the family and literally as he is driving away he hears the sirens of the officers that are responding to the scene and clearly the officers quickly determine that it is a homicide case a double homicide case and that she is missing she then, Jamie, gives a very detailed description, as 
does the defendant, how he was able to keep her inside his home all that time, which is essentially when he wanted to keep her confined, sticking her underneath a bag and using bags of laundry and weights so that she couldn't get out and or if she was able to attempt to get out, he would be notified. She was threatened on numerous occasions for quote unquote bad behavior, although she details to the police she wasn't really sure what that was and was continually being threatened by him that if she tried to escape or she wasn't good, that he was going to have consequences that were going to be far worse. He had actually had friends and, fam and family members, I believe, over the home, certainly people over the home during the time of this abduction, visitors, if you will, where she would be placed underneath the bed with the detailed uh, barricades that were there and told to be quiet or else. Eventually, he decides to leave for a couple of hours, and she is able to actually knock over the barricades that had her underneath the bed, sometimes staying in for as much as 12 hours without food, without water. Water and without being able to use the bathroom. She actually puts his shoes on and is able to escape. And you know the story from there where those heroic citizens find this poor girl. Uh, Jean Rossi, this is about as bad as you get. It's a horrible case. She was an innocent victim. This maniac just decided that she was going to be the one seeing her get on a school bus, kill two parents, abducted her. I think this guy is about as bad as you get, Jean. We got 30 seconds. Thoughts? Well, it, the, the facts are just egregious. And just being a lawyer and a put my defense attorney hat on. The first motion I'm going to make is to get this uh, venue changed because uh, with all the pretrial publicity, I don't know how he's going to find a jury that doesn't have some preconceived um, yeah. notion of guilt or innocence. Well, you know what? I say denied on that. You planned it. You premeditated it. She's alive. She can identify you. Say everything you did. She was there when her parents were slaughtered. He's confessed to it. This guy has no defense. It's a sick and sad commentary. We got to go to break. We're going to be right back. Okay, MacGyver, McGarger, uh, Gene Rossi, uh, we talked about this before. Prosecution's establishing a timeline here. I get why this witness is on the stand. Wants to say that the defendant was there on two occasions. Wants to bring out the fact that they're remodeling the home. Uh, Summer's a little upset because the paint wasn't done correctly or whatever, but he was supposed to come back on the 6th. So sh clearly showing that they didn't have intentions on actually fleeing. But let's not forget that this truck the car was found at the mojave uh, desert or, or rather on the border the bodies are found in the mojave desert and there's also this computer entry that we're going to hear about where on the mcstay family computer there's researching about mexico and getting passports for kids it's like so twisty here what are your thoughts about all of that i mean because i guess the defense is going to argue for some reason he had to get out of town well you know what is it possible that whoever took the lives of those four people may have done the research about going to Mexico to plant the seed? That's a possibility. And I do believe this, after listening and thinking about this, Bob, there's no way in heck that one person killed all four people. There's no way. I can't imagine one person did all this, bring the car to the border, bring the bodies to the Mojave Desert. So it could be a conspiracy among two, three, maybe more people. Who knows? Yeah, Who I, knows? I, Gene, I, I, your point is very well taken. I was thinking that at least with regard to the disposal of the bodies, that is not an easy thing. My experience has been it takes at least two people, two strong people to do that competently. Um, and, and you got four bodies here. I was always wondering whether or not at some point in time uh, they were able to lure, you had mentioned that earlier, or be able to perpetrate this through use of the kids and threat of harm to the kids at some you know, point in time. Again, we're speculating. I, Bob, I, I, I got to tell you this. I, I'm convinced there was luring because there's no signs of struggle in the home. Zero. Not for, forget the tape ducts and all this uh, you know, the paint can and all that. There's no signs of struggle. Was somebody in that house to possibly lure people out? Yes, you may have hit on something. Yeah, and I and would also explain, I mean, even though they're very young, look at those two little beautiful uh, 
you know, children, but they are quote unquote witnesses. And, and anything short of that is just, I mean, this is done in a really, you know, we look at that, right, as prosecutors, what's the manner and mechanism of death? Sledgehammering people's skulls is a really, if, it, if it's not to just accomplish a job, it just says that there's some hatred or anger or really it's a brutal way to do it. It's much easier to do it in other ways, and to be honest with you, with a lot less evidence available at the crime scene wherever that was. Right. And you know what, Bob? The person who did the murders, whether it's one, two, or three, they had a depraved heart, or maybe this was a hit job. Maybe somebody was paid. We don't know. I, we don't. Gene, I have been thinking about that as well, although I will say that there is some evidence at the grave sites of potential sexual abuse of Summer. Um, her panties were inside of the pants as if they were both pulled down right. at one time, and her bra strap may have been cut off. Um, it's really a confounding case, of course. That's why we're covering it on the Long Crime Network. Let's listen to a little bit more of McArger's testimony, and we'll come back with Gene on the other end. And you described Dan in your interviews as he's kind of an irresponsible person? Correct. And you, you, when Joseph was working with Dan, you learned that obviously Joseph was paying Dan. Correct. And your understanding that Dan was very dependent on the money from Joseph. I think Jackson so. calls for speculation. This thing would destroy. If there was an answer to the last question, instructing the jury is instructed to disregard the last answer. If there was And when you were speaking with Joseph on the third in the office, you were talking about the business and his relationship and working relationship with Dan, correct? Correct. And you knew Dan to be a loose cannon? Uh, yeah, a little bit from Joseph. And you would always ask Joseph, how's it going working with Dan? Because you knew how Dan was. I knew that Joseph... Uh, Objection, Your Honor. Violates motion and limiting character evidence. I don't know if the council approach. Actually, why don't we take our... Uh, so, Gene, the motion in limine, I believe that was being referred to there, was the judge precluding the third party guilt defendant uh, or, or person, Dan Kavanaugh, that the defense, we had read the text messages earlier, wanted to introduce, uh, point the finger at him and say he's the person with the motive, he's the person who had these surly text messages. Uh, with Mr. McStay, uh, and they got the wrong guy. They rushed to judgment. You could see from all these witnesses, they don't properly do an investigation. They got a cop doing a welfare check that winds up calling in the homicide squad. They're considering it a missing persons case. Uh, and then, you know, I'll take one more point that I, for the defense side that I would argue if I were a defense attorney. Then after they find the four bodies, it takes them a year to develop a case and say it's merit, I would be like, you know what that was like, folks? They didn't know which one to blame, so they took a dart, they threw it against the board, and they said, okay, a hit on merit. What are your thoughts about the combination of all that? I completely agree. I, I, it goes back to what you said earlier today about confirmation bias. They had all these possibilities. They had to find a hook on which to put their case, and it's possible that Charles Merritt was that hook left standing at the end. I did want it for the viewers, because they want to learn about trials. What the heck is a motion in limine? And real quick, a motion in limine is when the prosecution or the defense asks the court to make a ruling before trial to keep evidence out or to allow evidence in. And one's a defensive motion, another's an offensive motion. Right, and in this one, the prosecution was successful. We think it caused potential appellate issues in precluding the defense for having an alternative theory of the case. Gene Rossi, you are the best. We're going to go to break. We'll be right back. So, Gene, there, there's the sergeant, you know, and... and uh, he did the right thing. I mean, he, he noticed something was awry. You can't sit there on one hand and say, it was just a welfare check. I really didn't notice a dead body, as the prosecutor put it, or flesh or blood. The guy notices it's unusual, just like the friend noticed it was unusual. And this guy went from a welfare check to calling, not like his superior, a detective, another police officer, he called the homicide squad. You know what, Bob? This kind of troubles me a little bit. 
the person that should have been with that brother, Mikey, should have been a homicide detective ab initio, mm -hmm. not somebody who's doing a welfare check who then calls homicide. I, I, it, just, it just doesn't look like they had all their ducks in a row and they were ready for prime time. Well, you're introducing somebody into a potential crime scene, first of all. Gene, it brings me back to the chilly days when I would have to be at scenes <laughs> and people like a divining rod, and this is the way it goes down, say, oh, it must be the ex-husband or maybe this, and then all investigative data that points to anyone else is disregarded and all the stuff that may support the other person is accepted. The theory of the case is developed. They go in that direction. It's very hard for them to do reverse course confirmation bias as we talk about it, but moreover, I I don't want to be a prosecutor in court listening to things that were not done correctly that should have been done because it nicks at the credibility of the investigation and creates reasonable doubt. Yes. And to the prosecutor's credit, he is bringing this out during the direct examination, the good, the bad and the ugly. And for the viewers, it's called fronting, where your own witness, you bring out the bad stuff so that it doesn't have much of a right. sting on cross you front it absolutely agreed hey listen you can find gene rossi at rossi 4 va on twitter or myself at r bianchi b-i-a-n-c-h-i e-s-q or i would love for you to subscribe to my youtube channel bianchi law talk guys my time has come to an end i will be back wednesday the great aaron keller and the daily debrief is coming up next so don't go anywhere